My Nerva's Den DLC is something I didn't even know existed until Bioshock 2 Remastered came out, but even then, I never got around to playing it. Yet, while I was covering Bioshock 2, I got a lot of comments saying my Nervous Den DLC is the best release in the entire Bioshock franchise. So, here we are again, back in Rapture, and I have a simple question to answer. How good is Bioshock 2, my Nervous Den DLC, really? Is it good enough to justify going back to Rapture for a third time, let alone being the best in the entire franchise? Keep in mind, I've never played my Nervous Den DLC until today. Right after I finished streaming, I wrote a script, and here I am. I'm willing to bet a lot of you are in the same situation. People seem to have not played this DLC very much. Boy, if you think people have strong opinions on Bioshock 1, wait till you get to Bioshock Infinite. I haven't even posted a video about it, and I'm already getting dumb comments. Not looking forward to that. But if you want to see that in the next video, then consider subscribing. I'm almost at 250k, I'm trying to reach that. That's the mark I've been trying to get to for a little while, so help me get there. Also, huge thanks to my YouTube members. You can join them if you want to. They get to see my videos early. In my Nervous Den, you play as an entirely new main character, known as Subject Sigma. Still a big daddy. You can say you're on that big daddy Sigma grind set. Kill me. Anyway, the game starts off with someone really not wanting you to get into Minerva's Den. Minerva's Den is a special wing of Rapture that has been totally sealed off. Anyway, since you're a big daddy, you can survive underwater just fine, and soon you have someone talking in your ear by the name of Charles Porter. As this DLC goes along, you'll learn more about this character. Charles Porter was a researcher working on a supercomputer. The supercomputer is effectively a very advanced AI. They call it the Thinker. The man that was trying to keep you out of Minerva's Den goes by the name of Reed Wall. Reed Wall was Porter's colleague, working on the thinker with him. Now I know what you're thinking, okay, we have an AI situation, the AI is going to take over, AI is going to be very bad and just kill Rapture, but I never went that route. Instead, what quickly started to happen is that both Porter and Wall wanted the thinker for themselves for entirely different reasons. Porter is still grief-stricken over the recent passing of his wife. Meanwhile, Wall wants to use the thinker to get rich, predict stock markets, predict games, gambling. He wants the thinker all to himself. The more audio logs you come across, the bigger the rift starts to become between these two characters. I've been using it to predict the outcomes of baseball games, and it is incredibly accurate. Apply such equations to Rapture's markets. This thing is the money-making grail. But Porter, I have heard them feeding at recordings of his dead wife. The fool wants to turn the thinker into a person. I could not imagine a sadder fate for such a perfect machine. But there's a third character, Bridget Tannenbaum. She's back, the original scientist. She's been struggling to figure out how to reverse the effects of Adam, to make people not reliant on it. Throughout the course of this DLC, she will slowly find a breakthrough. But the first thing you notice in my nervous den is that Wall has gone insane. He is obsessed with the thinker. He thinks that the thinker can predict everything, the entire future. He is hell-bent to keep you away from the supercomputer. It is imperative to him. My Nervous Den DLC doesn't do that thing where it has micro-stories for micro-spacing, where every chapter introduces a new character, then you fight him to get rid of the roadblock. No, it is always Wall and always the thinker in your way. Eventually, the inevitable happens. Wall sets up Porter. He lets Andrew Ryan know that Porter is using the supercomputer to work with Fontaine. Ryan really doesn't like this, and jails Porter. Your concerned associates provided me with a recording of your own voice, swearing loyalty to Fontaine and his gangsters. Evidence of treason. My men are already on their way. Eventually, you'll even find Porter's jail cell, and you'll figure out what happens to someone who crosses Andrew Ryan. Well, Thinker, Ryan's secret police are on their way. They cooked up some kind of evidence against me. Treason, they say. I've heard what happens to folks who get disappeared, come back as one of those metal daddies. So I'm leaving you with something to cogitate on in my absence. Inputting rapture departure protocol. Figure a way to get yourself out of this city, thinker. You've got to live on, no matter what happens to me. You'll find a way. After figuring out Porter's possible fate, you continue on. Eventually, you do make it to the Thinker and confront Wall in the most underwhelming boss fight of all time.
I wouldn't have had him change that in any way. Porter then instructs you to get the blueprints for the thinker, as he wants to make another one topside at the surface after he escapes. Here is where you find out your true identity. You see now why I let the machine speak for you, Mr. Porter. We needed a voice that would be familiar, comforting, your own. With that copy of the Thinker's programming, we may return to the surface and use it to restore you to the man you once were. The entire time, the entire game, Charles Porter was actually the Thinker emulating your voice. You are Charles Porter, that got turned into a big daddy. It was established the thinker could do this right from the beginning of the game, where audio logs from Charles Porter were showing him trying to have the thinker emulate his dead wife's voice. This is such a good plot twist, because in hindsight, that's incredibly predictable. Yet, for some reason, I never thought of it. That thought never came across my head. I figured out Porter probably became a big daddy, just not you. Well, on the way back to the surface, you come across Porter's living space and things get a little depressing. I believe I'm done feeding audio recordings and personal anecdotes to the thinker. I am set to test the personality duplication function. Target personality, Pearl Porter. Thinker, are you ready? Yes, Milton. <clears throat> Starting test. Hello, Pearl. Hello, Milton. How... <clears throat> How have you been? Just wonderful, Milton. I've missed you, though. It's been so long. Pearl, I... No. No, this isn't right. It isn't her. Thinker, stop the test. But what's the matter, Milton? God. Don't you still love me? Oh God, I, oh God, I said, I said, end function thinker, now. It's over. Eventually you board a bathysphere with Ten and Mom to get back to the surface, and this is the end of the game. I lived through the Blitz, Pearl, and the fall of Rapture. They took my memory, my voice, everything that made me a man, but nothing ever scared me so much as saying goodbye. I wanted to save you. I couldn't resist trying to bring you back the only way I knew how, but you didn't want that. I know it now, and I think I'm finally ready to let you go your way. I stand here with the sun on my face, and it's almost like I can feel you smiling. Goodbye, Pearl. I love you more than I've got words for. Milton. This story has no right being as good as it is, and I certainly didn't expect it to be this good. They somehow managed to make a good ending about overcoming grief, all set in rapture. The immediate story was wrapped up nicely, and he can move on with his life, just without his wife. And while that is sad, he has come to terms with his grief. You can easily make an argument for this being the best story in all Bioshock, and I would have no arguments. But in order for my Nervous Dent to be the best game in all of Bioshock, it needs to be the complete package. Well, the gameplay is just as good as Bioshock 2. 
It's also just as good as these shirts. Andrew Ryan would have liked capitalism, so it's time for today's sponsor. You all know who Into the AM is by now. They make incredibly good clothes. Very soft shirts, very soft pants, they make good coats, even comfortable boxers. And they make shirts that definitely fit on dragons, this is very much so real. They're hot sellers from people that watch my channel seem to be their graphic tees, so here's a bunch of graphic tees that I personally own, I do genuinely wear these all the time. They have nice designs, they fit me well, it's really hard to find shirts that actually fit me well. I really couldn't recommend them more. They also have plenty of bundle deals, and on top of that, if you go to intotheam.com slash dragon shirts, you can get 10% off site-wide, and that will stack on top of those bundle deals or whatever sale they're currently having. Personally, lately I've been wearing this hoodie a lot, it is the middle of winter, and it is really comfortable. It's pretty much perfect for Pacific Northwest winters when it's in the 40s and rainy all the time. So hey, go to intotheam.com slash dragon shirts and get 10% off site-wide. Now let's go back to talking about Bioshock 2, my nerve is den. Yeah, gameplay is basically the same as Bioshock 2. You still play as a big daddy, you still use plasmids with one hand, you still have access to the drill. So as far as gameplay goes, I don't actually have much to say. That said, you do get access to some new toys. The first one is a new gun. A laser gun. Did somebody say lasers? This laser gun is a decent starting weapon. It's overall pretty fun to use. Just a constant laser. You will find ammo that is incendiary ammo that lights the enemies on fire, and that's pretty fun. You also find ammo that turns it into a charge shot, and I didn't really find this to be that useful. But my biggest problem I have with the laser gun is just that you eventually find the minigun, and it kind of serves the same purpose, so you have two guns that do the same thing. Even worse, the ammo you get for the minigun is just better at getting rid of heavies, so... Yeah, I kind of didn't use it much. Everything else about the weapons is more or less the same. The only exception is that you randomly come across upgrades for them instead of finding upgrade stations, but that doesn't really change a whole lot. As for the plasmids, you do get a new plasmid that's really fun to use. It just makes a black hole. The first upgrade you get for this plasmid turns it into a trap. The second upgrade adds acid on top of the explosion. It also breaks Ragdoll, apparently. <laughs> you know, I... I don't think it's supposed to do it like that. There is one more trick my Nervous Den does, and this is a pretty common trick for expansion packs. It adds new enemies in the form of just variants of previous enemies. For example, you find a Frost Splicer now, or you'll find a Laser Turret. It's not anything major to write home about, but it adds some variety and changes the gameplay up a little bit, so it's not entirely the same thing. Yet, despite all of this, I wasn't bored. I didn't find myself going through the motions saying, oh, I've already played this before, it's just more Bioshock 2. No, I was enjoying myself. For one really big reason. The map design is very good. This map design takes everything good about Bioshock 1 and polishes it out. What Bioshock 1 does is it locks you in this map and allows you to explore any direction you want to go. At least it feels that way. It's actually kind of a bit of a lie. Because the path itself is linear. The game just doesn't forced you that way immediately. It lets the player go at their own pace. My Nervous Den, on the other hand, actually just lets you wander wherever. All of these maps almost have a Metroidvania feel. And that's my biggest takeaway with my Nervous Den DLC. It takes everything good from every Bioshock release up until that point, and combines it into a cohesive package that's just really polished. So, is my Nervous Den DLC the best Bioshock release? Well, you could easily make that argument. Is it my personal favorite? I'm not sure but it's up there. It has the good map design from Bioshock 1, and the fast, smoother combat from Bioshock 2, along with writing that may actually just be the best in the entire franchise. You know what, no, I'm gonna put my foot down. I think this is actually the best story in all of Bioshock. I really couldn't recommend this DLC anymore. I don't know why I didn't play it sooner, but that's all I've got. Next video, Bioshock Infinite. Dragon, we'll see you then.